All right, welcome, friends. We are super excited to be continuing our deep dive into national parks. I have Jillian with me today, Ranger Jillian, I'm going to add there. And so she's going to tell us where she's coming from and all about her national park. Jillian, over to you. Hello. Welcome to our fabulous Fjord Ecosystems program from Kenai Fjords National Park in Alaska. So I've heard that you guys have been all over the United States today, but you haven't been anywhere quite as cool as Kenai Fjords, I promise you that. So today we're gonna to be talking about um, a very unique ecosystem, not just here in Alaska, but around the world. And that is a fjord estuary ecosystem. So let's dive in. Where am I located? I am pretty far north and you guys are in Kansas. Okay, so Kansas, you guys are kind of right here in the United States, landlocked. I am all the way on the West Coast and north. So it's relatively cool, temperate climates we've got up here. Um, and it's winter time. So that means we're experiencing a lot of darkness right now because in the summer we get lots of sunshine. Um, it's pretty, pretty cool place to be uh, year round. Taking a look at a map of Alaska, if we were to kind of zoom in, you will notice all of these dark green little spots on my map. These are all national parks here inside Alaska. There are over 15 national parks in the state. Alaska is huge. Um, so we've got lots of space for some of the largest national parks like Wrangell St. Elias some of the most remote national parks, like Gates of the Arctic, um, and some of the more famous national parks, like Denali, that houses our largest uh, mountain in all of the um, in North America. So uh, we are kind of the land of superlatives up here, but I am located just down here. Uh, my park looks pretty small compared some, to some of the others um, across the state, um, but we are super special uh, in our own right. So uh, you will see that we are situated along the Gulf of Alaska. So this is the North Pacific Ocean. So California and Washington and Oregon are down here. This is uh, Canada. And then uh, we've got water that swoops all the way up and makes its way to our shores here at Kenai Fjords National Park. And our location um, next to the ocean has a big influence on the type of ecosystems that are found here. So let's zoom in and take a look at a map of my park. So if we were to um, kind of be standing up above all of the land, we would be looking down on Kenai Fjords National Park. Hopefully you guys can see this boundary marker. It's light green. Everything south of that is my national park. So I want you guys to take a moment and look closely at my park. And what do you notice about it? So maybe talk with your teacher or talk with your neighbor beside you and say one thing that you notice about my park. Something that we notice. Something that may have come up is all of the white that you see. So this uh, may look like snow, but it is actually glacier ice which is pretty incredible. So we have about 51% ice in the park, um, which is a big part of the reason that we were established as a national park. Another thing you may notice is the ocean. So we've got a huge uh, ocean influence here. And then this part's hard to see, but these are all very steep mountains. And so we say that Kenai Fjords National Park is a place where ice, ocean, and mountains all meet together. So pretty incredible. Now when we're saying we... that it looks pretty large as well. So it looks large. And then there's kind of like someone said fingers, you know, kind of coming up. So awesome. Those fingers are so important. What a great observation you've made. Yes. So my friend Josh is going to be helping um, with the interaction back and forth. So keep contributing to the chat. We love it. 
Um, yes, those fingers are a big part of the reason we're a national park. Um, and this is uh, a phrase that I have taken from, from our uh, enabling legislation, the law that created Kenai Fjords as a national park. And it says that we're going to protect the wild and scenic fjords, which are those fingers that open to the Gulf of Alaska, where rich ocean currents and glacial outwash sustain an abundance of marine life. And so this is a very fancy way of saying that we are going to protect the water, we're going to protect the glaciers, we're going to protect the mountains because there is an abundance of marine life that depends on this place. So that is kind of what we're getting at today, um, is the ecosystem that can be found here at Kenai Fjord. I mentioned that it's a very special ecosystem, and it is only found in six places around the entire world. Um, so it makes it a really, really unique, special place, right? It's not found just anywhere. Let's take a picture, take a look at this picture here, um, taken from one of the fjords in my park. We've got the big mountains that we talked about. We've got glacier ice here built up on the mountains and we have the ocean. So remember, ocean, ice and mountains all meet together at Kenai Fjords National Park. And we're gonna be breaking down this, uh, this phrase, fjord estuary ecosystem. We're starting with the word fjord. This is a tricky one. It is uh, from the Norwegian language. And the FJ is kind of confusing for us because we don't typically put those letters together. So in your classrooms, we're going to all practice saying fjord together. So fjord. It's kind of a strange one. A fjord. What exactly is a fjord? It is a very long, very narrow U-shaped valley that was carved by glaciers and today is filled in with seawater. So as you guys can see, this glacier ice actually carved out this very long, very narrow U-shaped valley, but today it's all filled in with seawater. So hopefully you guys can see the ocean connecting all the way up um, into the mountains. So that is a fjord. It's the second uh, word in the name of my park, Kenai Fjords. So it's a pretty important part of um, our landscape here. Fjords, how do they form? How did they get here? Great question. Well, our earth is really, really old, about 4.6 billion years old. And as some of you guys may know, it didn't always look like it does today. Our planet, planet Earth, our home planet, didn't always look like it does today. The pieces, pieces of land were not always oriented like they are today. The plants and animals that you can find roaming on Earth didn't always exist. They kind of adapted to different climates over time. And so I am going to rewind back to a time period called the Ice Age. Have any of you ever seen the movie Ice Age or heard of the Ice Age? I bet some of you guys have. And so the Ice Age is where our story begins. About two and a half million years ago, there were large sheets of ice on a lot of Canada and Alaska here, and actually some places in the United States as well. So all of Canada um, and a lot of places in the United States, um, it looks like New York and New Hampshire and uh, Maine and Michigan were all covered in ice. Uh, they were all covered in the Laurentide ice sheet. And I, here in Alaska, am covered by the Cordilleran ice sheet. So, you know, two and a half million years ago to about 15,000 15, years ago, there were giant sheets of ice on the landscape. Today, Greenland is still covered in ice, but all of the rest of this ice, for the most part, has disappeared. Um, yeah, and I think how... some people are are connecting it. I don't know how historically accurate it is, but to the game, the the movie, right? So, yeah, of course. The movie was actually pretty historically accurate. I know there were a couple of Ice Age movies, but yes, 
It talked about the animals making big migrations to move away from the ice. Um, things started to warm up a little bit and then all of that ice started to melt. And that is exactly, um, that's exactly right. I'm glad you guys remember details from the movie. So here's a little graphic that shows how our fjords formed. So years and years, years ago, all of that ice, remember, was covering the landscape. About 18,000 years ago, things started to melt back as our climate warmed. And as that ice melted, these big, beautiful U-shaped valleys that were carved by those glaciers became revealed. And what happens when ice melts? it turns to water. So all of that water melted and joined with the ocean. And today we've got the big, beautiful fjords that we see today. So here's a map, another map of my park. Um, you can see the park boundary here and you can see all of this ice. We've got a big ice field in the middle, which is like a big giant lake of ice. And then we have individual glaciers um, that are flowing off of it. And so all of these glaciers at one point would have jutted out into the ocean um, way back when all of this was one giant ice sheet. Remember, they melted back and they revealed the beautiful fjords in my park. So take a moment and count how many fjords are in Kenai Fjords National Park. We have, I uh, hopefully you guys got to the number eight. We have eight different fjords in my park. And um, the one that I live on, I actually live on a fjord, which is pretty amazing. I live in the town of Seward and I live right here. It's where our administrative offices and where our visitor centers are. Um, I live along Resurrection Bay. And this is a little bit tricky. Um, if, it, if it's a fjord, why is it named Resurrection Bay? So that's one thing I want to clear up for you. Uh, fjords, are they a type of bay? So let's talk about the construction of fjords again. Remember, fjords are very long, very narrow U-shaped valleys that are filled with seawater. So this is a diagram of a fjord. It was carved by glacier ice. A bay, on the other hand, is a very wide, very shallow um, inlet of water. And this is caused by a uh, wave erosion. So two very different types of um, water, both, you know, sit right up next to the ocean. But remember, fjords were carved by glaciers. So that's a very important part of the fjord estuary ecosystem carved by glaciers. So we are going to move on in our fjord estuary ecosystem um, kind of equation. And let's break down what is an estuary. An estuary is a place where fresh water and salt water mix and meet. So uh, pretty simple, right? An estuary is where there is fresh water and there is salt water. There are four different types of estuaries out there. You don't need to really know these, but I do like to point them out. This is a river delta. Again, fresh water is coming from high in the mountains, flows down and meets up with the ocean. That's one estuary. We have a tectonic estuary where plates, tectonics, um, cause some sort of activity and they cause a split in the Earth's crust. And so this is Tectonic Bay is the name of it. And it is freshwater and it mixes and meets with the uh, Pacific Ocean here. This is in California. So this is all the Pacific Ocean. This is down in Florida. And this is a bar built estuary. Do you see how this land has naturally formed here? This is all a freshwater lagoon. And then this part is the Atlantic Ocean. So these two pieces, um, these two bodies of water are mixing and meeting right here. And then in Alaska, we have the Fjord Estuary, where we've got big, big masses of fresh water in the form of glaciers breaking off, mixing and meeting with the ocean. So this is the type of estuary that we have here in Alaska. And we see all those things we talked about, the mountains, the ice and the ocean all coming together. 
So um, our estuary, our fjord estuary freshwater input is all of that glacier ice. So we're gonna watch a video. Make sure you guys have your um, sound turned up because I want you to hear this glacier calving off and mixing with the ocean. Calving happens when chunks of icebergs break off the end or the terminus of the glacier. These icebergs can range in size from tiny pieces to floating mountains. This is a pretty spectacular sight here in the park. These are called tidewater glaciers, and they are the big glaciers that start up on the Harding Ice Field, that giant lake of ice, and then they flow down and they meet up with the ocean. So this is the ocean here, and we're kind of standing on a piece of land right next to it. And I want you guys to know, this is about 300 feet tall. So this is a massive big face of ice and all of this glacier ice is breaking off, is calving into the ocean. And there's lots of mixing going on um, within the uh, fjord estuary, which is pretty incredible. So the last part of our fjord estuary ecosystem is ecosystem. And since we have fourth and fifth graders in the room, I think that you guys already know what is an ecosystem. So I want you to talk to your neighbor and maybe discuss what do you think an ecosystem is? From what you can remember, what is an ecosystem? Are we getting anything in the chat? Um, no, they must still be chatting. But um, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask that you refresh my memory because, like, yeah. I'm pretty sure there's lots of different ecosystems. So I'm curious to learn about this one up in Alaska because I've never been to Alaska. So this is exciting yeah. to learn about. What is an ecosystem? So just in general, an ecosystem is a community where living things and non-living things interact, right? So we as humans interact with non-living things every single day. We interact uh, at school with our desks and with our notebooks. We interact with our refrigerator at home because it stores all of our food. So we cannot exist on our own without those non-living things to support us, right? So, Really quick, ecosystems and their influences. All ecosystems are made up of two things, living, which we call biotic, or non-living things, which we call abiotic. So here we have a harbor seal, biotic, interacting with this ice, an abiotic. On the beach here, we have this dead tree, a biotic thing, interacting with its abiotic environment. So biotic things do rely heavily on the abiotic things that exist around it. So I've got a couple of pictures here and um, I will do the first one together, but then I've got two more pictures that I want you guys to do as a, as a classroom. This is a picture from um, the shore, the ocean, the side of the ocean here, our shore side. And these are jellyfish. So they are biotic things living within this ecosystem and they are interacting with, they are heavily reliant on the water that lives around them. Jellyfish float around in the ocean and they depend on the waves and the currents to push them around and all of their food is um, living in the ocean waters around them. So these jellyfish could not survive without the ocean, their surrounding abiotic um, environment. Here's a picture. So as a group, I want everyone to point out what are the biotic things in this ecosystem? What is living? There's two things. Oh, balloons. 
Sorry about that. <laughs> all the good, two, all good. Yeah, the two living things here, hopefully you guys have pointed out, are the mountain goats and the grass that they're eating. So the mountain goats and the grass, oof, need the abiotic environment, which would be, what do we think is abiotic or non-living in this photo? What about the rocks and all of the soil? They need those rocks and soil to survive. So what we don't know, or what I know that maybe you guys don't, is this grass would not be able to survive without those rocks and soil. Those rocks have been broken down over thousands of years and have created soil, and then the grass was able to take root and then feed those mountain goats. So without the abiotic environment, those rocks and that soil, these biotic things, these mountain goats and this grass would not survive. Here's another photo for you. Um, the uh, biotic things in the environment are people. I don't know if you guys can see, but these are tiny little people. And we've got lots of vegetation on this mountainside here. And the abiotic or the non-living things would be um, the ice field and all of, again, the rock and the mountain around. So ecosystems can be small. They can be as small as a tiny area along the shore side, or they can be as big as this entire mountain. So ecosystems come in all different shapes and sizes. Your classroom is even an ecosystem. Great, so we've learned about what a fjord and estuary and an ecosystem are. Let's put them all together and see where these fjord estuary ecosystems exist around the world. Here we go. I have a map and I'm gonna point out all of these six places. Remember, they're really unique down in South America, up in Greenland, down south in Antarctica, north in Alaska, down south in New Zealand, and then up north here in Norway. And so we are gonna take a look at this map and notice what all of these places have in common. Yes, they all have fjords, they all have mountains, but specifically, you'll notice they are all located around the poles, right? Very cold climates, the North Pole and the South Pole. And so those are the things that fjord estuary ecosystems need are cold, temperate climates. Um, specifically, I'm going to, I only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to zoom through a couple things. The um, abiotic... We do, I was going to yeah. tell you, we do have, we'll just give people a heads up. We're, we're going to go for 45 minutes, but if you need to drop off, feel free to do that. But um, Jillian's offered to um, go for 45 minutes, so we're going to take her up on that offer, and we'll go through that, go through that. Thank you, thank you. Yes. So great, we will continue the presentation. So um, if you guys do need to drop off, we will continue on and maybe you can catch the recording later. So um, the abiotic things influence what you, what living things live in a place, right? Without those mountains and, or without those rock and soil, the mountain goats and the grass wouldn't be there. Well, without our glaciers and our fjords, we wouldn't have the living things that thrive here. So there are two main abiotic or non-living influences that we rely heavily on. Sorry about that, guys. And one is a fjord, a fjord estuary. We mentioned that already. We need all of this glacier ice, all of this freshwater input into the ocean, um, into the ocean ecosystem here. If you guys take a look at this photo, you will notice the color of this water. If you take a good look, you might see that it looks a little dirty. And that is because as glaciers flow down of the landscape, they carve away the land around them. Remember earlier, I mentioned how glaciers advanced on the landscape and they carved those big, beautiful U-shaped valleys that would become fjords. So as they carve, they pick up different rock and soil and debris, and it kind of is plucked up and just lives inside the ice. Now, when that ice eventually melts, all of that rock and soil debris um, kind of melts out in it. So this is a I picture. Wanted 
Yeah. Jillian, I wanted to ask a clarifying question on what constitutes ice becoming a glacier. So is there a yeah. length of time? Is there, is it seasonal? Um, so I'll let you talk about that. A glacier is just, uh, it has to do with movement. So the ice field is a giant lake of ice. Um, lakes, sometimes lakes drain out, but for the most part, they just kind of sit on the landscape. Um, and glaciers, so I like to tell, I have an entire program about glacier formation. So unfortunately we don't get to cover it here, but I like to tell people the Harding ice field is like the palm of your hand. So it's a little bit concave. So there's like kind of like a little bit of a hole there. If I were to pour molasses right in the middle of my palm, a little pool of molasses would start to form. My fingers are spread out. So eventually it would flow between my fingers down the floor and all of the little rivers of molasses are glaciers. They're actually moving downhill. So the big giant lake of ice is called an ice field and it's not actually moving, but individual glaciers, you can see, this has got a pretty steep slope, right? That ice is actually creeping downhill. So um, a glacier is considered a perennial accumulation of ice and rock and mud and debris that is moving. So good question. Yep, it, they can be any size. This is a pretty big glacier, right? It's, this, is, this is called Ialic Glacier. It's about a mile wide at the face. Um, but some glaciers are tiny little surf glaciers. They sit in little bowls up on the mountainside. So even this here is probably a little glacier. It's really tiny compared to this big one, but as long as it is still flowing downhill, it's considered a glacier. Yep. So this is um, our glacier is dropping lots of fresh water. Remember, this is our freshwater input into uh, this fjord here. And all of that muddy water is full of important nutrients for the fjord estuary ecosystem. So we've got iron and magnesium and potassium, all good nutrients, all ground up rock because it's ground away by the glacier and it is flowing right into our ocean. And our um, ocean is the second influence in the fjord estuary ecosystem. So we have a fjord influence and then we have an ocean influence. The ocean here um, is pretty volatile sometimes. We have huge shifts in tide. So we've got every day the tide shifts, high tide, low tide, high tide, low tide, and that's determined by the moon, our moon, um, but the tide is a big dramatic 10 foot tidal shift here. So um, that causes a lot of movement in the Gulf of Alaska, but we also have wind currents and ocean currents as well as something called upwelling that does a good job of mixing all of these nutrients around. And so it's that melting water, those nutrients that are being deposited, and that mixing that creates the perfect place for life to form. There is one other influence that you guys might not think about in Kansas, but has a big influence on all of our lives here in Alaska in the summertime, and that is the sun. So I mentioned earlier that it's wintertime, it's pretty dark here. So we are so far north that our days in the summertime are very, very long and our days and our nights in the wintertime are very, very um, long. So in the summer, we get about 20 hours of sunlight, which is pretty incredible here. And so it is all of that sun and all of those nutrients and all of that fresh water that create the perfect basis for life in the fjord estuary ecosystem. So when I think about, I want you guys to all think, what is something that is living, remember we're talking about life now, a biotic thing, that takes in sunlight and nutrients and produces its own food or energy. So what takes in sunlight and nutrients and produces food? I'll give you a hint. They use chlorophyll to do this. Where did we learn about chlorophyll? Some Someone said flowers, uh, Flat. plants, trees, or a few Perfect. things that have came in. Yes, exactly. Plants. So we are talking about 
phytoplankton. They are tiny little plants that are actually floating around in our ocean ecosystem. They're pretty incredible. And I have a short little video that I want to share with you because it shows you just how important they are to the web of life here in the Fjord Estuary ecosystem. So just a couple of moments. Let's learn about phytoplankton. They undergo the largest migration on Earth every single day. They number in the quadrillions and can grow as big as a car, though most can't be seen with the naked eye. Being underwater and out of sight means we rarely give them their due, but that's about to change. Shrink down as we enter the ocean micro world and discover the strange, the beautiful, the indispensable. Plankton. Just what is plankton? Greek for a wanderer, they're the plants and animals that drip through the largest habitat on Earth, the ocean. Plankton can be split into two main kinds. First, there's phytoplankton. These are algae and other plant-like single-celled organisms that are powered by the sun through photosynthesis. The world owes at least half the oxygen we breathe to phytoplankton. The second kind is zooplankton. These are the animals and they come in almost every shape imaginable. Some plankton live their whole lives as floaters Okay, so that was just a little snippet of phytoplankton. Uh, I heard a very cool fact. We owe half the world's oxygen to phytoplankton. These tiny little drifters in the water that we don't even see. Pretty incredible, right? I have two images here. I hope you guys can see them. It depends how dark your room is. Two images of a phytoplankton bloom taking place. So this is a picture um, of our park from, from NASA. They took it up high. And you can see there's still lots of snow on the mountains. This is early, well, we call it spring here, but to you guys, it'd probably be summer. Like in June, it's still very cold here. This is early June, and we've got, we've got a lot of that perennial snow. So snow that accumulated in winter is still on the mountains. We've got the ocean currents doing their thing. Just a few weeks later, you can see a lot of that snow has melted. Our glaciers are starting to melt. Temperatures have warmed up. And look at the phytoplankton in bloom. It's those beautiful swirly colors. My background is actually also a picture taken. It's not enhanced at all. This is just what color the water actually looks green here, which is pretty incredible. And so phytoplankton is the base or the, the base of our food chain here. I don't know if you guys have learned about food chains or food webs, but food webs are like models that demonstrate what organisms eat what to survive. So we all need, we know three things that we need for survival. Share with your friends, what are the three things we all need to survive as animals or organisms? Food water and shelter. Those are three very important things that we need to survive. And so food is, is number one. Without food, as, um, as animals, we're not going to grow, we're not going to reproduce, we're not going to survive. So this is a photo of phytoplankton under a microscope. And phytoplankton are fed on by zooplankton, tiny little microscopic animals that are also floating around in the water. And it is things like these oily fish that are trying to go after those zooplankton. And then we've got some bigger mammals that start to show up eating those oily fish, things like harbor seals and sea lions. We even have some friends that have migrated thousands of miles to feed here. These are humpback whales and they come up to feed in Alaska. We call these the supper seas because of the abundance of food that's found here. So those huge phytoplankton blooms are what is creating this amazing abundant marine ecosystem. 
because you have to have food to survive. And so these humpback whales have traveled many, many miles. And then we even have larger mammals, you know, apex predators, top of the food chain, things like um, killer whales or orca whales here. They are going after um, some of those smaller fish, salmon. Um, they'll even go after harbor seals sometimes. So we've got quite an abundance of marine life here um, going after, I'm gonna actually skip this video because I don't think we have time for it. Going after um, all of the little, little animals that are attracted by the zooplankton and the um, sand lance, the small oily fish. And so we have a pretty amazing food web here in Alaska. We've got the zooplankton or the phytoplankton. They are kind of the base of everything. Without them, none of the rest of this would survive. We've got the zooplankton, the tiny little animals. We've got fish. We have um, a little bit larger mammals here. We've got huge giant whales. We've got land animals that are even dependent on this ecosystem as well as humans. So. It's a pretty complicated place. Lots of different relationships exist within an ecosystem. We've got individuals that make up populations. We've got entire communities of animals coming together and interacting in this larger space, creating an entire ecosystem. So not just the living things, but also the non-living things, um, specifically the fjords and the ocean here. So I think this is kind of the end of my presentation, just the human influence on the fjord estuary ecosystem. We've talked a lot about animals today, but humans have been around for thousands of years and we have relied heavily on the fjord estuary ecosystem. Uh, these are the native indigenous people here. They're called the Sukhviak and they have lived in the fjords for thousands of years, harvesting from the sea. Um, these are kayaks. Kayak is actually a Sukhviak word that we have um, kind of taken and um, adopted as our own. Um, harvesting everything from the sea. This is a, a seal skin that's stretched over the kayak, um, heavily reliant on the marine mammals here. This is a local Sukhpiak woman um, today. She's harvested a bear and created this, um, it's called a gut skin parka. And so it's a waterproof material that she uses to hunt and um, we also, you know, in 2023, have lots of people commercial fishing out in the fjords. Um, we've got people mining for uh, gold. There's some gold out in our park. People are harvesting timber. But the fjord estuary ecosystem is always changing. It's a very unique place that draws people from all over the world for its beauty and for its rich resources. So I'm so glad I got to talk to you about the fjord estuary ecosystem today. Um, it's a little bit rushed, but I do want you guys to ponder what roles you play in your ecosystem, because we all do have a role to play. Um, and just remember, ecosystems can be big, they can be sm as small as your classroom even. So thank you for hanging out with me today. I hope I didn't go over time too much. No, you're good, Jillian, Ranger Jillian. Okay. Now, we always get a few questions about, and before I let you go, we did have... Um, or I'll follow up with an email uh, with with the attendees. And so question, I know we want to know what is we've loved enjoying learning about the ecosystem and how uh, especially it was interesting for me to understand uh, just all the differences and the animal chain that's there. But I want to know what is your favorite animal that's maybe part of that ecosystem? Yeah, that, so my, yeah, my favorite animal is probably the killer whale. They, okay. a lot of people say that, but they are such an intelligent creature. They live in pods, which are family units, and the head of the pod is always the matriarch or the grandmother. Mm. And she, all of the whales that are born within that pod will live and travel with their pod for their entire lives. So even the males, they will go off and they will mate with another with within another pod, but then they will come back and they have their own language, their own dialect. Each individual pod has its own dialect. Wow. And yeah. it's incredible to just hear them talk underwater. We have hydrophones sure. that drop down in the water so you can actually hear them talk. They're very intelligent, very cool creatures. 
All right. Well, we always love learning about our Rangers. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day today uh, to help us learn about fjords and all of the ecosystem that are involved there. So, all right, everyone wave goodbye to Ranger Jillian. All right. See you. Take care. Thank you so much. See you later. Bye, guys. Have a good one.